Good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome to the first lecture in our 2021-22 season. Those of you who normally are club members are looking in or wondering why you're looking at me. Uh, my name is Declan Foley. I'm secretary of the Cork Astronomy Club. Normally, Peter Household, our chairman, would be here to welcome you, but Peter isn't available tonight, unfortunately. So for better or for worse, you guys are, are stuck with me. So we welcome Dr. Robin Catchpole. He's an astronomer at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Uh, he's held posts in a range of observatories around the world, including the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Uh, he has either authored or co-authored 120 research papers and articles. He's used some of the most amazing telescopes all around the world, including the Hubble Space Telescope, which must have been amazing. His areas of research include the composition of stars, exploding stars, the structure of our galaxy, galaxies with black holes at the centre. And his current research area is the structure of the bulge at the centre of our own Milky Way. But the thing I nearly omitted it, the thing that he's most uh, best known for, is that he actually went to the same school as our chairman, Peter Household, a very exclusive school in, in, in England. So that's probably what he's best known for. Hello. As you know, I'm in Frankfurt. And because I'm worried that the uh, connection may be not very good tonight, I've decided to pre-record this talk. And I will, of course, be present while the talk is played and will answer questions live afterwards. So, if we are to apply the laws of physics to astronomical observations, it's essential that we make quantitative measurements of distance, position, and motion, because without these, we can't get quantitative values for the um, absolute temperatures and fluxes and so on and so forth. But so, to start that story, I want to go back 2,500 years to the time of the ancient Greeks. And just to set the scene, um, I'd like to just tell you that today we're measuring the position of stars in the sky about a thousand million times more accurately than they did uh, 2,000 years ago. But the ancient Greeks were a smart lot. Around uh, 500 BC, the Pythagoreans realized the Earth was round, and this was obvious to them from observing the shadow of the moon and noticing that as you moved further south, you saw a different set of stars. Stars appeared to come above the um, uh, horizon. And here we can see in the modern eclipse the obvious fact that the Earth is casting a circular shadow on the moon. And this is also apparent from this uh, montage of images um, that I took myself in um, 2015. Around 300 BC, the Greeks also thought that the Earth goes around the sun. And this would imply that stars show parallax. But in 300 or so BC, Aristarchus suggested that no parallax was seen because the stars were too far away. And just to remind you, I'm sure everybody knows what parallax is. Um, parallax means that uh, if we consider a view of a relatively nearby star, and say today, uh, and then six months later, it will seem to have moved uh, compared with the uh, more distant background stars. Now, around 200 BC, Hipparchus made the first star catalog of about a thousand stars, which was then incorporated into Ptolemy's catalog around 150 AD. And we, the accuracy of the star positions was somewhat better than a degree. And you see in this picture, Ptolemy is holding a device used for measuring angles. Um, now, I just want to set a sort of scene to show you the scale of things. And what I want to do is to use the Earth as our globe to um, uh, consider distances. 
So we're all familiar with the globe on the left there that can represent the surface of the Earth or the sky that surrounds it. And here, this bar is one degree long, which is six naut 60 nautical miles or about 111 kilometers. So what that means, that is an angle of one degree subtended from the uh, center of the Earth. So we're going to use the Earth as a sort of grand celestial globe to think about our scales and so on. Now, early Greek thinking was considered cosmological speculation and was replaced with geometrical modeling, which sounds a pretty sensible thing to do. But this resulted in the emergence of the Ptolemaic system of concentric spheres with the Earth at the center, and it relied on circles to produce an increasingly complex model to satisfy increasingly um, accurate observations. I, I, having said that, Hippocrates noticed and explained the unequal length seasons due to the sun moving in a circle around the Earth, but with the position of the Earth offset from the center of the circle. So, by the beginning of the 17th century, observations of star and planets were accurate to a precision of about a minute of arc, which is about the limit for the human eye. And here we see Tycho Brahe, who used uh, a great mural quadrant, we see uh, depicted on the right-hand side of the picture. Um, he's famous for having a prosthetic brass nose as he lost uh, the bridge of his nose in a jewel. So let us just see what a minute of arc looks like. Well, here we are, one minute of arc, about 1.8 kilometers. And as you know, there are 60 minutes of arc in a degree. And this is about the limit of the resolution that you can achieve with the human eye uh, measuring angles in the sky. So there it is, projected on the ground. Now, um, a great change occurred in uh, around 1543 or so when Copernicus returned the sun to the center of the universe. And as you know, uh, Kepler used Tycho's very accurate observations of planetary motion to simplify the sun centered model by using ellipses instead of circles. And of course, the, these ellipses were explained in by Newton's theory, which was published in about 1686. Now, the kind of return of the sun to the center of the, well, universal solar system could then return our hunt for stellar parallax. Um, clearly, um, this was something that was not possible if the Earth was at the center of the universe. So stellar parallax was back on the cards. And with the invention of the telescope, this allowed Flamsteed to make a catalogue with an accuracy much better than a minute of arc of about 10 seconds of arc. And I love this illustration here. This picture on the bottom right shows Flamsteed making his observations. It's painted on the ceiling of the, the Great Hall at Greenwich in the old uh, Oh, what's it called? The, the naval uh, place there. I can't think of the name for a moment. Um, and you'll see, uh, even in this painting, Flamsteed has a somewhat lugubrious look, which uh, is well cartooned in Sharp's uh, notebook that we see. He was uh, taking these observations. And you will see the background uh, diagram that we've been looking at for the last few slides shows the factors of 10 increase in accuracy and it's plotting that accuracy against time. Now, this more accurate catalogue allowed Halley to compare his catalogue or Flamsteed's catalogue with Ptolemy's catalogue. So here we are 1,500 years later and this allowed Halley to note that some stars had actually moved across the sky. This we call proper motion. Nothing to do with parallax yet, but certainly what's called proper motion. That all the stars in the sky are orbiting the center of our galaxy. Now, observation 
accuracy improved and the search for parallax was still going on when Bradley discovered something that was really quite unexpected. He was looking for the effects of parallax by looking at stars close to the zenith and in the top picture is what he expected to see but um, from the little diagram you can see how the relative position of a star seems to change across the sky after six months or so and below we see what he observed which was exactly at 90 degrees to what he expected allegedly he um, was rowing across the thames and watching the flag on his rowing boat when he realized that uh, he had discovered another effect called aberration which is due to the fact that a star's position is changed in the sky due to the fact that the earth is orbiting around the sun at 30 kilometers a second which is a fraction of 300,000 kilometers a second the speed of light if you like the beam of light um, the telescope moves um, at a significant distance um, between the beam of light uh, going through the object glass and arriving at the eyepiece and this gives us the impression that the angular position of the star has changed in the sky. So the, the effect is the order of 20 seconds of arc or so. And finally, after about 2,000 years, the first parallax observations were made um, around about 1838-1840, more or less simultaneously by uh, Bessel um, for 61 Cygni, True as Struva observed Vega and Henderson of the Cape observed Alpha Set. Um, the parallax of all these stars was the less than a second of arc. So Aristarchus, I think, was quite right that uh, the problem is the stars were an awful long way away. So now, just to give you an idea of what a second of arc is, it's about 31 meters on the surface of the Earth. It's a sixtieth of a minute, and here we see it marked out on University College um, Cork and um, the central uh, green. And what this means in practical terms is if you walk that distance and looked up in the sky, you would see a star in the zenith had moved, changed its position by um, a second of arc. Actually, it would all be complicated by the fact that the star was moving around the sky anyway. This little simulation, which I think if I press, hopefully is running now, was made by uh, George Rickey and it shows um, the actual observations made by Bessel. Um, the circle is about a second of arc in diameter and you can see successive observations. You can just see the parallax wobble there if you like and the gap between his observations. He used this split lens that allowed images to be brought close alongside each other, so you could um, compare the relative positions of images. So here we have the position up to the um, 1830s or so, and um, we start on the first step of our ladder of the cosmic distance scale um, by measuring parallaxes. And indeed, this led to an industry of parallax measurement that went on for about a hundred years until uh, from the latter 19th century um, well into the uh, 20th century. And these observations were typically made by these uh, large long focal length refractors. This is the 26 inch, 22 feet focal length, uh, gives 30 arc seconds per millimeter. And between 58 and the 80s, when it stopped observation, it took 30,000 12 inch by 12 inch square photographic plates mainly for parallax and proper motion and indeed i took some of those plates myself this was always going to be a difficult exercise because the images are about a second of arc in diameter and one who wants to look at uh, fractions of that diameter now to convert parallax into into a distance we must know the distance of the earth from the sun and this turned into a separate industry maybe i'll just back off for a moment 
and point out that Kepler's laws enable us to form a accurate model, a scale model of relative distances of all the planets from the sun in our solar system. Um, Kepler's laws, of course, based on Newton's laws. But um, if we want to uh, find the absolute distance, we have to calibrate one relative distance. And this led to careful observations of the movement of minor planets, locations of Venus, and Mars, and so on. And it was, in fact, a very difficult observation, all suddenly made void, if you like, by the uh, use of radar, which enabled us to bounce radar signals sent from the Earth off the planets to measure the light travel time and the distance. So the work of months could be done in a matter of seconds. And this shows, uh, well, a 400 kilowatt transmitter on the Arecibo telescope, which sadly collapsed uh, last December. So we've uh, calibrated with radar the bottom of the cosmic distance scale ladder. And just to remind you that, of course, stars are far away. A parallax of one arc second, that means theta subtends an angle of a second, corresponds to a distance of three light years. Now, uh, to improve parallax and uh, proper motion, we must rise above the Earth's atmosphere. And this was uh, first done in 1989 with the Hipparchos satellite that essentially looked simultaneously by, with the split mirror at two different positions in the sky and brought images of, the, of stars at those two positions onto a grid and was able to measure the relative positions over a period of time with an accuracy of about one thousandth of an arc second. So this resulted in an enormous jump in the accuracy of the observations that we could make. So here we have Hipparchus, a thousandth of an arc second. And now on the scale of the Earth, just to give you a feeling of what a thousandth of an arc second looks like, this is it. Here's a ruler. This is a thousandth of an arc second. And um, we've got the pins here. And just to give you a flavor of what you can do, you could take an area of sky like this, um, the famous area of Orion and the Orion, the Hyades, the Pleiades, seen face on, if you like, um, the view we have from Earth. And now we can plot the distance of these individual stars. So we're now looking at a plan view. So we're over where the sun is, looking to the right, and we see the Hyades cluster here, the Pleiades cluster here, Betelgeuse, Rigel, and the Orion Belt stars strung out up to about a thousand um, light years or so. And from this, of course, we can deduce all kinds of important um, astrophysics, the relative brightness of stars, and the relative brightness corresponds to their age. The most luminous stars being born in Orion today slightly less luminous stars in the Hyades and the Pleiades are younger, somewhere between the Hyades and, and Orion. Now, this uh, um, satellite was succeeded by the Gaia satellite, which was launched in December 2013. And here we see it in the laboratory. And it relies on the same principle, two mirrors looking at two different parts of the sky um, and simultaneously observing them, so one can measure their relative positions. But this uh, was going to go a very, very much fainter. It was going to see far more stars, as we will see, at uh, fainter magnitudes. And unlike Hipparchus, it's not orbiting the Earth. It is at one of the Lagrangian points uh, beyond the Moon's orbit, where it um, scans the sky. And in fact, it's now had a possible extension until 2025. So what is the precision? Well, we've gone nearly, well, not quite a, another factor of 100 
in precision here because the Gaia satellite will achieve seven millionths of an arc second or so. And in order to see seven millionths of an arc second, remembering we're using the Earth as our scale here, um, we have to look at the size of a pinhead. And here we see bacteria on the size of the pinhead. And here is a distance of seven millionths of a second of arc, um, which is pretty stupendous when you, when you think about the accuracy that Gaia has achieved. So this is what our our diagram looks like now, and we are, as I said, a thousand million improvement in uh, precision over a period of 2,000 years or so. Now, one of the fun things when we work to this degree of precision is that we must consider the effects of general relativity. And this is a model of the solar system um, seen from Gaia and, um, you, and with the effect of the sun taken. Out. If you remember, the gravitational deflection of the surface of the sun is 1.75 arc seconds, a quarter of a million times more than the smallest error of precision. So Gaia has to take account of the moon, the earth, and the major planets in um, working out uh, the position of stars, has to take account the gravitational deflection. So what do the observations look like? Well, it comes back to the same area of sky every so often. So you will see individual observations here, a strong proper motion with this parallax effect, depending on orientation, depends what the parallax movement looks like. So the star is moving and it's moving from side to side on the basis reflecting the Earth's rotation around the sun. So what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at over a billion, a thousand million individual sources. And we're not just looking at their positions, we're looking at their spectra and their um, velocities. So we are obtaining many parameters for these observations. And this is not an image of the sky. It is actually a compilation of individual data points from the Gaia catalog. In principle, it's got 1.7 thousand million stars here, only about 1% of all the stars in our galaxy. And we're showing the color of the stars and the dark absorption clouds are just the absence of stars. So this is just a plot of Gaia data. And of course, it allows us to get all kinds of parameters um, this is effectively a color magnitude diagram for um, the large Magellanic cloud. Now, this is the very simplest way we can look at some of our data. As you know, the Earth and the solar system orbit around the center of the galaxy at 200 or 20 kilometers a second. So if we were to take the Gaia database and instead of just showing individual dots for stars, we show their average velocities. Blue shows that they are, the stars are blue shifted and appear to be coming towards us. Red that they are apparently going away from us. And you'll see, um, looking at the same area of sky, a patch of blue, little patch of red, a patch of blue, and then a patch of red. Looks all rather complicated, but it simply arises from the fact that there is differential rotation. Stars inside our orbit around the galaxy move faster. Stars outside move more slowly. So compared with us, these are moving backwards. These are moving forwards. So depending on what angle we see them. So if we look back here, this star is coming towards us fast. That corresponds um, to um, one of the blue patches and these stars on the outside are all moving, um, apparently, uh, away from us uh, quite fast. So that accounts for this rather complicated pattern. But, and it immediately gives us a model of the rotation of the galaxy. Now, one of the exciting things that Gaia has revealed is the structure of the halo of the galaxy, the discovery that it's not just uniformly filled with stars, but 
we can see streams of stars, um, stars associated with previous collisions and absorption of bodies into our Milky Way galaxy. And this is epitomized by the sort of data you can get from Gaia, although this comes from previous data, where we have composition, young stars here, stars with very few metals down here. We see stars like the Sun, all going at plus 200 kilometers a second around the galaxy. And then here is a bunch of stars going in the opposite direction around the galaxy at minus 200 kilometers a second. And they have very similar uh, compositions here. And so this is a group of stars that was probably acquired by our galaxy. So by combining the velocities, the motions, the compositions, we can start to sort out the contents of our galaxy. Now, Gaia is ongoing, and you will see the precision we've obtained here. Um, sorry, up, up with the first release, this was Hipparchos. Here are the errors in arc seconds. Um, the first Gaia release was a bit of an improvement. The second Gaia release for faint stars is very close to this, this red line here. So um, this is something of ongoing data. And what that means is that we can extend parallax um, as a means of distance so that it well overlaps um, things like variable stars or main sequence fitting. And just to give you a sense of what we've done, um, so far um, the Gaia distribution of objects observed by Gaia with precision distances corresponds to a sort of distribution like this uh, reaching to the center of our galaxy we're out here at this little blue dot at the bottom there. So the next step in the cosmic distance scale ladder is the use of variable stars. And we now have surveys that um, uh, variable stars may be Cepheid variables and Myra variables. And we now are able to get extraordinarily high quality light curves from uh, various survey telescopes and the work that we require doing is done initially in the large and small Magellanic clouds. They are about all the stars in the large Magellanic cloud, about 160,000 light years away, all essentially at the same distance, which means that when we identify individual variable stars, as we see in these strips of sky, we can take one variable star here, um, we can work out its, uh, observe its period, and we can plot what's called a period luminosity relationship, which tells us how the brightness varies with period. Now, in order to calibrate that, what we have to do is find some similar stars of known distance in our own galaxy, and then we can calibrate this period luminosity relationship and extend it much further into space. Now, I must just very briefly mention a couple of other methods. You'll see main sequence fitting. This is an idea that's been around for a long time and is epitomized by this diagram where all these different clusters of different ages have been fitted on top of each other and the relative fitting required to bring their main sequences into coincidence gives us um, their relative uh, distances. Uh, it's true Gaia has shown us there's a lot of subtle detail that's involved in this uh, and much of the many of the problems associated with all these methods, whether it be a main sequence fitting or um, the Myra um, period luminosity uh, laws, depends on, on composition. Now, I must, this tip of the red giant branch is a new method that is proving extremely valuable. And what it depends on is the fact that after leaving the main sequence, hydrogen burning continues in the shell until at the tip of the red giant branch, core helium burning is ignited and a core helium flash 
and a star um, immediately drops down uh, back down uh, the, the, the giant branch. And what we find is that the tip of the red branch, giant branch is something that is very clearly defined. And it's only in the recent era when we can measure the brightness of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of stars, that these kind of techniques become possible. Now, this uh, technique relies on the fact that maybe there are thousands of um, red giant branch stars for every Cepheid variable. So we can take a much more statistical look. Also has the advantage that this bit of the color magnitude diagram is plotted from stars associated with this galaxy, but in this field to the left. And so that field is not um, problematic insofar as there's no interstellar reddening of any significance, which the Cepheid variables will suffer from because they're buried deeper in the galaxy. And so we remove some of the problems. Um, and here's another example of very recent work um, from the um, large Magellanic Cloud. I should perhaps also me uh, mention that most, the most powerful methods of distance determination are referred to as direct uh, methods. And sadly, these are few and far between. One example of this is in this uh, galaxy, 4258, where we have a disk rotating around a black hole somewhere at the core. And this accretion disk shows what are called masers, which is in the, um, in the, in the gas, uh, a water maser, uh, a stimulated emission coming from um, the, the background source stimulating um, and causing these masers to shine in, in a series of little blobs. And we can observe the velocity of these masers as they rotate across the line of sight. And we can observe their radial velocities as they move um, uh, away from us in the line of sight. And by essentially, if we can equate the transverse motion as they move across the face of the source um, with a velocity, um, then we can combine those two. An angular uh, distance with velocity gives us, but speed time time gives us a physical distance. Then we can work out the distance directly to these objects, quite independent of parallel or periods and luminosities and so on. Now I'm conscious that time is running out, so as ever I must speed up and move out of our galaxy again, um, and we come to the work of Hubble, who realized that uh, there was a relationship between the redshift and um, the distance uh, uh, of galaxies. And if we move to something like the Fornax cluster, we're looking at the a distance of 60 million light years or so, and stars can still be resolved with the Hubble telescope, maybe up to 100 million light years. But the expansion of the universe has become quite appreciable. So we're using our variable stars to give us the physical distance, and we are measuring the, the radial velocity. And so we have this very simple idea. We can see um, that this is a little model of our expanding universe. Look at the top there. The guy on the left is looking at the nearby speaker car, and it's going at five kilometers an hour. And he says it's 10 kilometers away, or she does. And um, a car twice as far away is going twice as fast. This is the property of a uniformly expanded universe. And so we can work out the time since the cars were all together uh, at the starting line. And that uh, in this little model is two hours ago and corresponds to the, in our case, um, well, how long ago it was they were together. And in the case of the universe, it corresponds to the age of the universe. Now you'll see for my little car experiment, I've worked out H naught 
which is the, the speed over the distance, five kilometers an hour over 10 kilometers is 0.5 kilometers an hour per kilometer. And it's all very logical. And one over H naught equals the time since the start. The problem in astronomy, if we measure the uh, expansion rate at 71 kilometers per second per megaparsec, we mix units, something we were told to do never at school, uh, kilometers with megaparsecs. And um, believe it or not, one over H naught comes out to be 13.7 thousand million years. We should really express H naught as 8.5 times 10 to the minus 15 kilometers per hour per kilometer. Um, but there you are, we don't. So we now have a method that we calibrated with our tip of the red giant branch and our variable stars for finding distance called a uh, redshift. And so we can launch out into the universe and measure the redshift of every galaxy that we see. And in the process, as a result, we can make this wonderful map of the universe in terms of galaxy redshift. So there we are at the center, the further away, the greater the redshift and the greater the distance. But the problem with a diagram like this is that we have only measured the redshift distance directly for the galaxies within about the red circle at the bottom left. So extrapolation is very dangerous. So we need a new form of distance indicator. And this is the type 1a supernova. And so we now again have two methods, redshift and supernova distance. So this started a huge survey that eventually uh, uh, won the Nobel Prize, looking for very distant supernovae and comparing the luminosity distance given by the supernova um, with the redshift um, distance given by uh, the radial velocity. And it turned out the supernova appeared too faint compared with the redshift. And this, of course, led to the evidence for dark energy um, or possibly dark matter that ran the Nobel Prize. And um, just by, for reference, I, I uh, show this diagram here. And we see um, when we compare distances given by the two methods, we find a, a correspondence today. Um, we find when we look into the distant past, um, the expansion of the universe was slowing down. You'll see constant deceleration line at the bottom, constant acceleration above. The universe was slowing down. And now the a, a rate of expansion seems to be speeding up, which gives us um, this particular diagram here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip right to the very end. And you will excuse me doing this at very high speed. I'm not sure what is going to happen here. But if anybody wants to bring any of this up in questions, um, I would just skip to the point where we see the microwave background. And you will be familiar with this bit of the um, peaks corresponding to acoustic oscillations in the early universe. Um, and exactly how they fit depends on various parameters in the universe. Normally, I'd be talking about um, um, you know, the makeup, the composition of the universe today. But we don't have time for that. So I just want to show you that again and come back to what is proving um, to be an exciting and crucial uh, diagram. So very, very briefly, this diagram shows how estimates of the Hubble constant have varied with time. And the first thing to notice is that various methods started off with rather large error bars, and the error bars have got smaller. Now, there are two methods here, the cosmic microwave background. Now, from those relative peaks, it is possible to work out how fast the rate of expansion of the universe 
during the time that it was becoming optically thin and we were seeing the the pattern of the microwave background um, appearing in the sky. So the speed with which it became optically thin governs the relative peaks there and allows us to estimate a value of the Hubble constant. The more familiar method is by measuring the expansion rate of the universe today, and that is by the method of um, the Cepheids. So you'll see back in 2004, there was perfect agreement within the error bars, perfect agreement. You might think, well, we could have all gone home and you know, given up. But as observations have been refined, there is now a very significant difference between the two methods. Now, in here, this red thing is called tip of the red giant branch. And that's the method of uh, distance that I mentioned, and you'll see it seems to fall between the two. And you might think, oh, well, problem solved. But unfortunately, it's not as, diff as, as simple as that. There's a lot of controversy about the problem, whether or not um, there are systematic errors here from the way the Magellanic Clouds were used. There are also issues about whether there are still systematic errors in the Cepheid uh, measurements. Now, I do know I've heard talks from people who work with the microwave background and say the problems are here and here, and other people are suggesting that no, this may reflect some forthcoming excitement in cosmology. Anyway, I see I've overrun by a couple of minutes, and I, well, perhaps I'll apologize for jamming in a lot of extra slides, but I will stop talking now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Paul initially and Tony, who are going to um, take the questions. And uh, before we do, um, can, can I rob a, a trick that Peter does, which is to get in and ask the first question? He's great at it, so why not? You were talking about the, the Hubble constant and the huge debate at the moment between the cosmic microwave background radiation and the separate variables measurements. Will the launch of the James Webb telescope, which should happen towards the end of this year, will that help solve the, the, the problem? Um, I, I, it probably will, but it's not clear to me exactly how. Um, the debate, I'm, I'm going to take these headphones off so I can hear myself better. Um, the debate at the moment seems to be around possible systematic errors with the Cepheid variables and um, also the fitting of the tip of the giant branch. And there are technical issues here and uh, about how it's done, as well as issues about the effect of abundance. Now, what we really need are more direct uh, methods of measurement, like the one I mentioned about the um, accretion disk around the black hole. And the talk I went to suggested that if we use that method of calibration, to, uh, which is essentially, there are only one or two of these, then the discrepancy between the cosmic microwave background and the Cepheids went away. So it almost looks as though we've got to find some way round finding more direct physical methods. Now it's possible with the infrared proper abilities of the James Webb that we might be able to look in detail at things like accretion disks. It's also perhaps more likely that things like the whole Earth uh, telescope that imaged the black hole um, shadow or the square kilometer array might be the ones that are going to lead us in the right direction. Uh, thank you, Robin. That was very interesting. Uh, quite a few of the members of the group chat have already thanked you. Uh, the first question comes from Colin. What ground-based or science-based, space-based telescope due to launch in the next few decades do you think we should be most excited about? <laughs> well, that's a difficult one when you say in the next few decades. I mean, the obvious answer to that is the James Webb, 
uh, and I'm certainly keeping my fingers firmly crossed for the launch, which was in October, but is now in December. Um, that is, is going to be able to look back in the universe um, to the time of the first stars. So I'm certainly excited by that. There are other telescopes that are going to tackle the dark energy, vacuum energy project that require making observations of tens of millions of galaxies. I'm a little bit less excited by that, but that may be very important. <laughs> uh, the next question comes from uh, Derek. He says, fantastic, thanks Robin. I love the way you link the accuracy pro and progression over 2000 years of astronomy back to the everyday distances here on Earth. Question is, is there any new gravitational wave astronomy that will contribute to the cosmic distance ladder? Um, that, that is interesting because in a sense, the, um, the gravitational waves do give us an alternative method of um, measuring distance. The, the intensity is, is directly related to the nature of the phenomena. So, so in principle, um, we should be able to get um, a, a, a new uh, calibration because if we, know, if we know where these events took place, uh, we'll have something like redshift. And um, the uh, intensity that it's measured um, is directly related to the, the periodicities and so on. You know, the black holes ring down, uh, merge very rapidly, the neutron stars more slowly, and that's related to luminosity. So, yeah, there certainly will be a gravitational um, wave, um, either period luminosity law or distance scale that will emerge. Uh, next one comes from Helen. Excellent, excellent lecture, Robin. In your distance calculations, how do you allow for unknown gravitational deflections en route, on equal expansion rates in the universe expansion time dilation? The um, issues with, I, I'm not quite sure where that relates to, but certainly as far as Gaia goes, a Gaia is only measuring things within our own galaxy. Um, so the, uh, the main um, gravitational effects there are uh, due to the, the planets and the sun. Um, these other issues of um, whether we live, uh, this business of to what extent the local expansion of the universe depends on where we are within the, in the universe, whether we're on the edge of giant clusters and so on. Um, that, that is certainly a, an ongoing sort of background issue, the extent to which that may affect the whole way we interpret Hubble expansion. Yeah, so that's a good point. We have our next question. Uh, Dennis Manny, why has Hubble's constant change a few times? Is it due to our methods of measuring distance be becoming more accurate? How have the changes affected our estimates of the age of the universe, and will it change again? Yes, the, the Hubble constant has changed. I mean, it is very confusing. It, it's called the Hubble constant because it's supposed to be um, the rate of expansion of the universe, which was supposed to be inviolable, constant, but um, it has changed enormously in the... Um, in the last 50 years, and um, even 30, uh, let me see, maybe 35 years ago, um, there were two values of the Hubble constant, 100 uh, and 50. They were 100 and, and 50, so a factor of two between them. And the two camps claimed that their values had errors that were like 100 plus or minus 10, 50 plus or minus 10. And it's somewhat amuses me that the current value is just about midway between. And so what is the cause for this? It's all to do with the problem of the distance scale, how we measure distance. And um, up till now, that has largely depended on the calibration of the distance of Cepheid variables. So we as you saw, we measured them in the Magellanic Cloud. We get the period luminosity. 
Then we need the distance to the Magellanic Cloud. And the problem was there were only one or two Cepheid variables that had half decent parallaxes. So that was where it was very, very weak. And that has now been strengthened considerably by Gaia. So the issues we face now are what um, effect does composition, as you know, older stars have less metals, heavy elements. What effect, if any, does composition have on the behavior of, of these objects? At the other end of the scale, the Type 1a supernovae, I just took them as standard candles, but there is a very strong effect there that has to be calibrated out. The fact that their period of decline uh, depends on their, their luminosity and their period of decline are related, and those can be calibrated out. But um, wherever you look, there are issues. Um, and for instance, the direct geometrical um, thing that I looked at depends uh, essentially on the, on the disk being circular. Um, because the radial velocity that we measure has to be equ equated to the sideways movement of the Mazars. And if it's going in a circle, that's fine. But if there's any elliptical motion, then that'll have a systematic effect. Michael Gauss asks, sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, can we see O2 13 billion light years? Um, oh, yes. Um, we can only see. It, and this is in theory, in practice, we can't quite see that distance. We can only see as the distance that light has been able to travel since the start of the universe. So um, we can see, when we look in the sky, galaxies that can see a lot of the universe that we can and will never see. So the simple answer is yes. How big do we think the universe is? Well, when we look at the microwave background, that is our, our view of the observable universe when it was very young, and, we, and you might say from one side to the other, 90 degrees apart, 180 degrees apart, there's less than 1% variation of systematically. So you could say in a hand-waving way that, the true universe is probably at least a hundred times bigger than the observable one, but it may be a million or a billion mm. times bigger. Yeah. So in a word, yes, there's an awful lot of universe we can't see. And if the universe continues to accelerate, then there will be, as time goes on, we'll see less and less of the universe. Things will get redshifted out of sight. Helen, again, asks if everybody, if everybody in the universe is moving at multiple directions, at multiple speeds, is it true to say that uh, object positioning is not a permanent state? Uh, I, think, I think what, yes, what they're saying is that everything is moving. So yes, we are orbiting the galaxy, um, and the galaxy is moving in the local group. So yes, there, um, Interestingly, there is a sort of local standard of rest, and that is defined, interestingly, by the microwave background. And um, when you make observations of the microwave background, the first thing you have to extract is what's called the dipole, because we, um, we are moving at about 600 kilometers a second, in a particular direction with, the, uh, with respect to the microwave background. So interestingly enough, there is once again a kind of standard of rest defined by that microwave background. And that's made up of our velocity around the, star, uh, around the center of the galaxy, our galaxy's motion in the local group, and probably that motion with respect to the larger local groups. Yeah. Next question is from John Bowen. When we talk about the expansion of the universe, where does it expand into? Ah, well, <laughs> that is a very good question. And um, uh, the problem for us 
is that it's completely counterintuitive to say it expands into nothing because space and time are the stuff of the universe. And what is happening is things are just getting further apart from each other. Um, so it's in a, in a sense, it's a question you can't answer. But string theorists who talk about um, this just being uh, three or three dimensions of space and, and one of time that have inflated in a multiverse, you could say, well, there is the uh, higher dimensional multiverse and somehow the universe is expanding inside that. But uh, not a satisfactory answer. I think, I think it is best to think of that it's a, a question that can't be answered because the universe is everything. It is the space and time. Stuff is just getting further apart. So it's not expanding into anything. It's just expanding. Okay, John Flannery. I guess that question, Michael, is also in relation to the size of the universe, 85 billion light years across, and age of the universe, 30.7 billion years. It brings the idea of inflation into the discussion then. He's just passing a comment there rather than asking the question. Anyway. All right, yes. Yeah, that's that's the last one. It's probably nearly time to wind us up anyway, Declan, is it? Uh, we're getting close. Just a, a question on that there, where we're talking about the size of the universe, 85 billion light years across. If we don't yeah. know the size of the universe, how can we say it's 85 million light years across? Well, I, I think what is being said there, that bits that were um, uh, together, um, at the start will now be at that distance that we um, things that we could we things that we could observe earlier on uh, and we see the way they are when the universe was very young are now some of them at that distance and of course they're unobservable because they're expanding away from us now at the at greater than the speed of light, which is fine. The universe can do that. It's a bit like it's, it's the same sort of way of saying, if you look at the Hubble Deep Field, you will see lots of tiny little galaxies, um, you know, fragments there. If you could get to the, where the Hubble Deep Field is today, um, and, uh, in other words, if you could rush over and look at those galaxies today, so you'd have to get there, instantly you wouldn't see them anymore because by now they've all merged and they're turned into giant elliptical galaxies like the galaxies around us so it's it's kind of associated with that so those galaxies exist today we 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 only see them when they were very young but they're still around today um, except they're outside our horizon. We can't see them, we can't communicate with them. So that is, I think, the basis for that uh, statement about the current size of the universe. It's not something I like to use. Um, I like to talk about the observable universe. Um, I don't know if that helps clear it up. <laughs> I see the look of um, not entire you know, belief on your face. <laughs> But uh, another, another question, so Robin, um, from James Dawson. Interesting talk. Is there one problem you'd like to see resolved before you retire? Ah, uh, oh gosh, yes. Um, um, well, I suppose um, I, if uh, I, the thing that I, I have seen that I never thought I would see was the de detection of gravitational radiation. Um, I think that the problem I'd like to see would be finding a, a planet like Earth that might be um, not only habitable but inhabited. Um, I could say I'd like to know what the value of the Hubble constant is. I can't say I get terribly excited about that. Uh, <laughs> I should. Um, I could say that I would like to see the Res the nature of dark matter and dark or vacuum energy solved. Because I think 
those things are going to be tied up with particle physics and the origin of the universe. Yeah. But I guess the thing that would excite me most would be to find a, a planet around another star that um, was maybe inhabited um, or more than habitable. It had some complex life forms on it. I doubt if that's going to happen. Do effects on the speed of light by, say, large black holes affect the returning data in the distance calculations? Um, no. The, um, um, the, re the, well, there are two ways of answering that. Returning data is not um, affected by anything like that. We, we have to allow for the distortion of of gravity in our local solar system. Um, I think what the question is more saying is that um, when we look at the evolution of structure in the universe, um, one of the things that affects the light and position of stars is the distribution of dark matter um, as opposed to dark energy. And that dark matter does distort the directions from which um, the light from distant galaxies seem to appear. And that method will be used to explore the evolution of the clustering of dark matter, which is one of the ways of trying to discover the, how the expansion rate of the universe changed with time. We have simple models that show that it seems to have been a near linear process. Um, that is like Einstein's vacuum energy term. But there is a hint that it wasn't completely linear. Uh, and this, if it isn't completely linear, if it didn't just increase uniformly with time, then this will tell us something about the nature of vacuum energy. So, yeah, in a complicated roundabout way, the presence of dark matter distorts our view of the distribution of background galaxies, and that can be used to show how the clustering of dark matter has varied with time or redshift. And that will give us clues about the nature of dark energy and um, um, and possibly vacuum energy as well. Uh, that's probably another talk in itself. Indeed. Okay, we, we'll leave the, the Q&A there. Uh, thanks a million, Robin. That was an absolutely fascinating uh, uh, presentation. I could listen to it all night. Um, it was a bit of we had to skip some slides toward the end. Personally, that's an area that I find uh, mo most in interesting. Listen, thanks to everybody. Great to see everybody. Uh, thanks especially to Robin for such a fascinating lecture and staying with us.